You're listening to This Week in E-Commerce, the Ecom Nation podcast. Dive into the top online retail headlines with your hosts, Paul Waddy and Mal Chia. Let's load up the cart. This Week in E-Commerce, episode 10. I am Mal Chia and with me again is Paul Waddy. Good morning, Mal. Hi, everybody. Mal, how have you been? I've been really good, although I'm sounding a little bit. I've, I've got my my phone sex voice on at the moment. You did um, nasal. I, yeah, I've, uh, I've 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 had a cold last week, um, and then I went to a metal show and screamed my lungs out. So my uh, my voice hasn't quite caught up. <laughs> who did you see? I went to see a UK band called Berry Tomorrow, who were who were fantastic. Berry Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> they are, along with uh, other bands which have recently announced tours like um, Behemoth, Sepultura <laughs> coming down to Adelaide, which is great. So, Sepultura. Yeah. Yeah. It's a blast <laughs> from the past. <laughs> all the classics, all the classics. And how have you been? Yeah, been good, been good. Another um, another busy week for uh, for us and a busy week in, in e-com. It's like um, every, every week we sit down and um, there's always something happening out there. So this week's no different. So <clears throat> looking forward to discussing a couple of uh, exciting, uh, eventful things with you and a um, couple of Aussie things, a couple of US things and a couple of uh, Black Friday myths. That's right. We are going to be busting some Black Friday myths. Hmm. But before we do that, we just want to give a big shout out to our good friend, Heather McIlvain uh, from Inside Retail, um, who announced this week that Inside Retail have launched a US publication. Um, Heather, obviously, you know, one of the driving forces behind Inside Retail, who do a lot of really great work um, in Australia, like really breaking a lot of awesome news um, and really highlighting some of the great things that are happening in the e-com um, and retail sector, I guess, around Australia, um, launching in the US, which is uh, quite an accomplishment, you know, I feel. Yeah, massive, massive. Um, just like all, all online retailers, uh, the, the US seems to be, uh, you know, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. But um, congrats, Heather. She's obviously an, an inside retail play a massive part in Aussie e-com. So, um, yeah, looking forward to seeing what they can do in the US. And um, that's a great move. Very happy yeah. for everybody there. Absolutely. And there is a great article uh, which I've launched with called Is the DTC Business Model Dead or Just Evolving? Um, which is really one of the best articles I've read about this in, in a while. And it does call out a lot of the same um, case studies, which Paul and I have been talking about the last few weeks, um, such as Warby Parker, Dollar Shave Club, um, you know, uh, and a few other brands as well, just talking about how they were able to grow and kind of like what the for and against is for, for those business models. So this is one which um, obviously we've been talking about a lot and over the next couple of years, we'll probably continue to gain traction um, a little bit. Another piece of news which came out uh, yesterday, actually, is that Designer X, um, who Paul and I interviewed um, uh, the, the founders on, um, at on Online Retailer, um, have come out and announced that they have partnered with Uber Direct. So Designer X, for those who don't know, offer um, dress rentals um, for, for high-end dress, dresses, uh, you know, um, cocktail dresses for parties and weddings and things like that, um, which you can rent. Um, and now you can actually have it delivered to you within two hours for that last minute, um, for those last minute invitations you get and you need something special for. And I think that's, uh, we talked about this at, at online retail. I think it's just a great fit for them. We, we said it was going to be a great fit and lo and behold, a couple of months later, here we are. Yeah. Well, I think it's um, good for two reasons. Uh, if, if direct um, point to point delivery is ever going to be relevant, it's in women's fashion. Um, and uh, the other thing is it, it eliminates that kind of, um, I guess that three to f even that, even if you don't need something today, the, the, the risk of like, oh, will it arrive in time for Friday is also eliminated by this. So in my experience with point to point delivery, um, it doesn't necessarily move the needle in terms of like massive conversion rate uplift, but it does, it just eliminates, it gives you that sense of security. Like Uber will tell you exactly when it's coming. You know, it'll be there today. Even if you don't need it today for tonight, it just eliminates that, oh, the postal network, three to four days kind of thing. So anything that um, can be done faster uh, and gives more certainty in e-commerce, I think is good. And I think that um, I actually used, that you used JB Hi-Fi not long ago. And I gave it a spin later using Uber, you know, their, their um, Uber delivery service. I bought something um, just to test it out after you did. And it was, I've got to say, it was super cool. I don't even remember what I paid for the, for the delivery, but I'll do it again because it was just, 
yeah, it was with, it was, I didn't really need it that day, but it was with me now. And again, it was just that certainty. Or, I don't know where I'm going to be in two days, three mm. days. I hate being carded. So again, for me, it's just certainty. So I, um, you know, I don't think these things move the needle massively, but they, they're a nice experience and it, and it ties in nicely to that peak end rule, which is to provide you a, a kind of wow experience. And, um, and that's nice because if you're, you know, buying a nice gown or renting a nice gown, some of them are quite expensive. That's a nice moment to receive it. And it's and it probably um, also a really nice moment to have it you know, hand delivered straight away. So I think tapping into a um, not just a good logistics network there, but just tapping into a really nice customer ex- experience for Designer X. So, you know, well done to the guys. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes to show that, you know, that, that we are willing to pay that premium for convenience. Um, yeah. you know, and that's why I've used that service for a while. I've used JB Hi-Fi and get things delivered because like when a headphone breaks, like I had AirPods, I need to buy some new AirPods the other day yeah. because one just started glitching. I just very quickly hopped onto the website, ordered, and within while I was on the same call, my new AirPods arrived. I put them on and away I went. This is a new AirPods. And I recently had to do this again when I was traveling as well, where I needed to get something delivered to me um, because I had left uh, my my USB dongle um, at home. So I had to get a USB dongle delivered to me and I, can get a, I could go straight to the clients um, to then do a presentation without having that awkward, oh, does anyone have a dongle? And yeah. Well, now that's a good point. Like we know um, everyone's sort of discounting, particularly, you know, we'll come to that in a minute, discounting and fighting each other on price and margins are under pressure. And then you make a move to offer a premium service and people will pay for it. Um, we, how do we know that? Like you don't need to run an A-B test. You need to just see that Uber has made it. Yeah. You need to see that <laughs> Uber Eats is has made it. Like Uber Eats, some of the dollars we're paying for, you know, local Thai food is outrageous, but we still pay it. Because it's convenience. So the whole myth that people won't pay for convenience, like convenience is a genuine value proposition. So I think, again, it's just a reminder that while everybody's fighting each other on price and trying to be cheaper and cheaper, you can actually offer value in other ways. And I think convenience, um, as they say, time genuinely is money. So um, convenience is something that brands need to think about. You also see the same with click and collect when brands offer click and collect it usually goes quite well because people like the convenience that, oh, that's on the way home. I'll swing by and pick it up. So I think, um, yeah, big shout out to those guys for offering a really convenient user experience. Yep. Costa, Kristen, well done. Uh, looking forward to, to seeing how this continues to, to yeah. help your continued success uh, with Designer X doing some great things. Now, another story we want to jump onto before Black Friday is Birkenstock. Um, I, had a, I had a pair of Birkenstocks when I backpacked through Europe when, in, when I was like 19 years old, I think. I was wearing a pair of grey Birkenstocks through there, and that was like my, my, my footwear choice because <laughs> it was just very comfortable, um, very long-lasting. Um, and I haven't owned a pair of Birkenstocks since, so I was actually surprised to see that they had recently IPO'd. Mm. Um, they're a brand which are kind of synonymous in that, chunky footwear you know but also at a kind of a luxury price point because it is fairly expensive um that they they had the ipo last week um Mm. which is probably the first real true retail ipo of the of the season i know we've talked about um you know um uh, instacart we talked about um clavio earlier but this is the first true retail one and it was a complete flop. Um, mm. The big thing about this was that they had a listing price, like their 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 listing price was forty six dollars, meaning that institutional investors who bought during the IPO period, um, you know, in the lead up to the IPO, were able to buy it at forty six dollars. But the opening price was forty dollars, <clears throat> and you almost never see that. Mm. And it That's just pretty goes. Bad. It is pretty bad. And I look at this and go like, okay, well, do people look at this and just go, well, there's, where's the upside? And I think it was very overpriced. Like Birkenstock are valuing themselves at, you know, something like $1.46 billion, um, which I, I, I don't think is quite right for a footwear brand like that. When you consider like what Nike is, and Nike is obviously in the hundreds of billions, um, they just have a product, a very niche product at that. Um, and I I can't see them ever scaling to the to 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 the size of like a Nike or, or dare I say even a Crocs because they are not a cultural phenomenon. Mm. Yeah, worst um, <clears throat> the worst uh, IPO um, for a company valued at over a billion dollars in two years. Um, the worst IPO de- debut. So yeah, I think it's interesting. So um, 
I, I, I haven't seen enough. It, it's like, I don't know their financials, so I, hard to say. $42 sounds pretty expensive when we've seen some recent um, IPOs go that with some great companies at less than that. Um, again, billion dollars sounds pretty outrageous. You, you would have to say like um, Birkenstock would be capitalizing on the goodwill out in the market at the moment because they, they have gone through a resurgence since, since your days backpacking through yeah. <laughs> uh, that's when shares that's when the value started to increase actually but the um you you would have seen like uh fear of god you know did a collab with um birkenstocks i started seeing like two two three years ago i, I remember seeing <laughs> shout out to, to miguel fernandez if he's listening but he was came into the office wearing birkenstocks and i was like dude no never and then my wife was wearing them and i was like what are you, what is going on here? <laughs> and I thought they were the most disgusting things I'd ever seen. And then I started seeing people wearing them with socks and wearing them different ways. And I was like, okay, I can appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm, I still haven't stepped foot into one. I don't think it suits me. But nonetheless, they are everywhere. And you look at uh, Google Trends at the moment, and they are at a, they they not just at a high because they've listed, but for the last five years they have been getting <clears throat> bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's got to be some sales volume. They obviously think they're, you know, to quote Zoolander or the other bloke, they obviously think they're hot right now. The market maybe thinks they're not so hot right now. But um, that's a fizzer. Didn't go well. Yep. Um, flip side, Clavio continues to do well. I think. They are. They're, they're continuing to trade above their above their listing price, um, which is which is ultimately what you want. The last thing you want is to launch, and then within a couple of weeks, and you do see this quite often. Uh, within a couple of weeks, you are mm. you are soon trading below your listing price, and that's uh, that's a sign of a broken IPO. Mm. Um, so in this case, Birkenstock, well and truly a, bur- a broken IPO. Um, look, I just think while they, but while like you said, they've grown, they they've doing some great collabs and things like that. They're still not showing that continued upside, you know, to mm. be a brand which can be, you know, like a, like a tech company, you know. Um, not to say, and I think part of it is looking at like, is a listing really the best thing for you, or is it better to look at acquisition and kind of look at like, you know, is if if you are working towards, you know, something your exit is looking at um, an IPO, it may not necessarily be the right path. For you because i think the only people who really get rich from that are the institutional investors <laughs> the vcs are the only people who really get rich from ah uh, well, that, well that that's the whole that's a topic for another day but that's the yeah. whole um the whole thing isn't it like you've got to un- you've got to really understand what what is your objective by ipoing like the uh, you know the the objective that oh we're raising money for growth is oh. Yeah, raising money to pay bankers is usually the, the reason for IPO. Yep, there's certainly better ways to raise money. Hmm. All right, on to our big topic for the week, which is we are now going to bust some Black Friday in this. Um, we have just passed Prime Day, um, which I didn't really, really hear too much about. So we're one week on from Prime Day. There was nothing really in the news except for some ads and things like that. And there wasn't really the, the whole hoopla, particularly when Amazon announced how well they did. Um, one week on. So I don't know how well they did, but my suspicion is that it didn't really go off like how they expected. We're one week out from Click Frenzy, and then very soon in November, everyone's going to be starting their Black Friday sales. So before we enter this period, and I'm sure everyone's uh, you know been talking a lot about how to make the most of, of Black Friday, and certainly we have, um, we're going to bust some Black Friday myths. So Paul, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw you some myths, and then we're going to have a discussion about each one. So I've got three which I want to run through. Cool. You ready? I'm ready. Cool. All right. The first one is that retailers always profit on Black Friday. Hence the what? term Black Friday. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, maybe they should change that name because that's a that's a big myth. Um, you know, we've spoken about this so many times. I, I feel not much excitement around Black Friday because I, I think there's so many fundamentally you hear so many retailers talking about it as if it's like the be all and end all, but any month where you are relying on discounted sales to achieve, you know to achieve your revenue, you know that that's coming <clears throat> at a um, at a cost to your your bottom line. So the short answer is um, there are many companies that'll do really really well on the strength of their own channels. So <clears throat> not smashing Facebook. If anything, you know Meta. If anything, pulling that back. They've built really good email lists. They've got great retention. They've got you know they've got. Um, st- solid CRM strategies in place, uh, which we spoke about uh, at a Clavio and Ecom Nation event last week. Um, <clears throat> but there's a way too many brands here who will do two things. Um, there's brands that will go from January through to October 
uh, unprofitable, losing money, and then will aim to break even or make a slight profit uh, in November. And what that means is as a founder that you're being paid once a year. Um, you're not getting paid fortnightly or monthly, you're getting paid yearly. And quite often then you're, you've outlaid so much for inventory that you're in a cash hole. It's a really nervy time, uh, especially as an e-com advisor, because you see lots and lots of cash, um, cash going really, really low. Um, you see heaps of brands make more money in October than they do in November, simply because they are, they are discounting too much. Um, the reality is if you're discounting 30% uh, off the bulk of your goods, um, you're going to probably have to pull back your, ad, your um, marketing spend by 5 to 10% um, to try and even remotely balance that out. But if, say, you spend 20% on ads, um, and, uh, and then usually, and then you spend 20% again in Black Friday and discount it in, um, 30%, you're, you're going to lose money. So um, stacks of businesses um, losing money, Mal. And um, the scary thing is, or the sad thing is that uh, lots don't seem to care and, or they don't seem to be aware. So that's, um, that's a sign of not, not a great business. Mm, I'm definitely seeing that as well, um, particularly talking with some businesses. Um, I think, uh, you also have the added pressure of the ATO as well, which I've which I've heard from a few from a few small businesses who are saying that in this particular period now, it's like after the ATO was fairly lenient through the COVID oh. years, now we're kind of out the, out the back of that. They're being far more aggressive in terms of chasing um, various tax debts, and there are several retailers I've spoken to who, unfortunately, did not did not properly save over that period. Oh yeah, um, and now and are now being hit with that. So that's something else which we, which you got to consider as well. Um, but in terms of that, going back to you know, are you always profitable on Black Friday? Like you said, hell no. Mm. Um, and understanding your unit economics becomes really really important rather than just looking ca at cash in. That yes, cash is king, but that cash needs to pay for something mm. at the end of the day. So you may look at it as being like we're going to do X number of million dollars worth of sales. But that's that, that 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 money just goes back towards paying for more stock, paying for your staff, paying for your advertising. Rarely does it ever leave you enough if you are in the position where you know you are relying so heavily on Black Friday to turn a profit um, that you're ever going to actually have enough money left to actually reinvest back into the next year. So you end up with this compounding problem where the next year you need to borrow more, yeah. you know, you need to do things like that, you need to go on more sales, um, and you, but you don't have enough stock to actually go, go and do the sales. It becomes a vicious cycle, and if you stay on that treadmill, you know you're on a road to ruin. Mm. You know, I think you made a good point there about the ATO as well. That's a, such a good point right now. They're super aggressive, and a lot of people are using November to clear that to clear their balance sheet up, like to pay off tax bills, clear their super, pay back the loans that they've borrowed for stock, and then they buy for January and February, and they're back to square one. Mm. That's also, as you said earlier, that's the sign of a broken model. If you're just cleaning your balance sheet in November, and then starting again, you should be going in with a clean balance sheet. And uh, November should really just be another month that you use to clear excess inventory if you're covering if you're holding too much stock. Yeah, the best retailers use November as a period to kind of just like you know undo some of the mistakes they've made, but they're not relying on it. Mm. You know, and matter of fact, I'm, I'm there's there's a few who we're working with who are barely even going to be doing Black Friday sales. Mm. You know, they're Absolutely. going to be doing some sort of offer, but more like a you know gift with purchase or yep. things like that. They're certainly not discounting. Absolutely, November. and that's the ideal position you want to be in. Yeah. All right. The next question, uh, the next myth is that all new customers acquired are going to be profitable in Black Friday. No, I mean, that's, that's definitely another myth. And we've seen that um, with brands that we've worked with before where, you know, every dollar spent is actually a dollar lost or 10 cents lost, um, particularly when you're talking about meta. And, and that comes back to a couple of things is um, uh, the amount that you're spending, um, you, you're, you're spending 20% uh, normally throughout the year and you maintain that 20% spend while you're discounting. Um, a lot of brands don't look at their cost of goods sold um, or their margins when they're just setting their MERs. And this is why, uh, as you, you and I know, there's no cookie cutter approach to setting an MER. Like you've, you've got to know, if, if a brand was to ask us, like, how much should I spend on marketing? And, and we said 15%, we, we don't know because we need to know your margins. What's the offer you're going out with? Every approach is different. So you do run the risk of, um, of, of actually losing money um, when you're or acquiring unprofitable customers, when you're discounting um, and relying heavily on paid media and overspending, and the the other thing is, it's um, I, I learned this um, the hard way in my very early days, like ten or fifteen years ago, 
um, when you're hunting for bargain shoppers, that's what you get. You get mm. bargain shoppers. And, and that means they might not purchase with you ever again. They might just churn on to the next brand. That, of course, depends on what you're selling, which is that we've spoken about before, being unique with product. Um, but discount shoppers are a unique breed and they are not a loyal breed. They're, they're price sensitive. <laughs> And this is why, again, I, I get really nervous about any strategy that involves being a, a cost leader. So I think you've got a um, question one, the customers that you're acquiring, which again is why it's better to nurture your existing database. And two, how much you're, you're spending to acquire these customers. So I think that's a, that's a myth, Mal. Yeah, that one's busted. Um, busted. I also could say, like, in terms of a good report to look at if you're on Shopify is your cohort analysis report. Um, so if you have done Black Friday before and you've been around for a few years, have a look at what the retention rates are for the customers who you've acquired in November and December in previous years. And I almost guarantee you that you'll find that their retention rates you know, over a 12-month period or even a 90-day period are significantly lower than customers you acquired at any other time. So you also need to be cognizant of that as well, that, you know, that yes, you're going to be spending, if you spend more on marketing, which most people invariably will, you also need to watch your CAC because mm. if your CAC explodes and you're not acquiring enough new customers, it means that you're acquiring them extremely unprofitably as well. And you're making pretty much making like a first order loss and probably a lifetime loss on these customers if you don't watch your numbers correctly. So you've got to make sure that you look at, you have realistic projections in terms of like how many new customers you're going to be acquiring for that period, what their lifetime value is, and then make sure that you're also factoring that into your budgeting as well. Um, the other thing, thing as well, and this is a bit of a myth, is that the customers who you acquired during that period, I, I always feel like, you know, you're not really acquiring new customers. For that period. You're, the, the customers who really you should be focusing on are the ones who've been checking out your brand for like the mm. two, three months beforehand, you know, who've been sort of browsing and window shopping, haven't been ready to make that jump. And now you're giving them that extra push rather than going aggressively for brand new customers who've never been seen your brand before over that period. I feel those are the ones who are harder to acquire because you're competing against everyone else. Whereas if you're focusing on the ones who have already been window shopping a little bit, um, you're already in the consideration set. So they're more likely to make that jump to, mm. to purchase from you. Yep, exactly. All right. Our last one for today is you need, and we did touch on this one earlier, is that you need to spend more on advertising during Black Friday to get noticed. Well, um, as a percentage uh, of your revenue, MER, you need to spend less uh, to preserve your profits. That's the main thing. Now, again, um, there'll be some brands out there who, uh, maybe you're already sitting on like a 25, really healthy 30% net profit who can maintain their marketing spend, take 5% off, you know, 10% off even their net profit. And that dollar figure is so much bigger that sure, it's, it's worth it for you. So here we're really talking about those brands who are probably sub 20% net profit um, who just run the risk that if that you maintain your marketing spend at 20%, what you actually might find is that um, yes, your net profit will obviously decrease because, as a percentage uh, because you've 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 um you've overspent on marketing um, relative to your discounting, but you might also find that your dollar figure is not as big as previous months. So definitely have seen that before, where you run that sale, you 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 keep spending the same, and your your dollar figure is less than October, and you're like, oh, I got somehow got that wrong. So I think it's um um you made the point earlier about um. Was focusing on the months beforehand. And I think that's now it's like, we should be focusing on top of funnel now to introduce people to the brand so they can discover it for the next 30 days or so. Um, and then they can be ready to purchase. Mm. I think if you're leaving your run to, you know, the week before or two weeks before, and you just, your plan is to smash the ads as much as possible. And lots of brands will do that. Uh, it just won't work because right now we've got to get into the conversation. And then in, in November we get into the wallet but I think um, fundamentally, any business whose um, business model is to spend more on ads to get noticed. Now, let's think about that. You are competing straight away with um, people who have bigger marketing budgets than you. And that's almost everyone. That's, <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's Amazon. That's everybody. So if your goal is to outspend the co competitors to get share of wallet, unless you're, you know, Bill Gates, that's not going to work. Um, and even then, a lot of these massive businesses we talked about last week are losing money. So they'll spend aggressively. We, what was that one? Anyway, spending 60%. Parade. Well, who was it? Parade underwear. Parade, yeah. And there's, some of these brands will spend 60% of their revenue on ads 
to acquire market share and to sink you? Do you really want to go up against that? So I think anyone whose strategy leading into cyber is to spend more uh, on ads is is playing in a very, very com- um, hyper competitive space where uh, your competitors often don't care about making money. So I think you've um, ad, ad spend is going to be a part of your your strategy. I think you need to spend less as a percentage to focus on your profits so that you can make some money and, and really set your business up for 2024. Yeah. And I think, you know, along with that, spending less is then also spending less, but then also reallocating where that spend is as well. So making sure that you're focusing on those higher intent customers. So like I said before, you know, building out some custom audiences of people who've been to your site before over the last few months, but haven't purchased potentially, and really more aggressively targeting those guys to convert those people who are a little bit lower rather than someone who's never heard of you before, who you're competing against everyone to really focus on those audiences who have heard about you before and may be more likely and more receptive to see an offer from you over this period. So making sure that, you know, right now you may be spending like 25, 40%, let's say for argument's sake on top of funnel, you know, more like awareness and reach, but you can then start flipping that towards reallocating a large chunk of that towards more your middle of the funnel. So bringing down your overall spend, reallocating it more towards middle of the bottom of the funnel to make sure you're capturing all that higher intent customers and traffic um, who, who, are, who are already receptive to buying from you rather than trying to convince someone in that two, three, four week period um, totally. to, to take a punt and buy you for the first time. The, the, you come back to your point before, like if, so if, if you haven't done the activity two to three months before, you have nothing in that middle to bottom funnel. So now we've got to get that engagement. <clears throat> middle of funnel could be someone who's engaged with your socials as well. Organic social plays a huge role in this. I, I'm seeing too many brands, I think, be a little bit too like, um, um, I, I'm going to say like they treat organic social like it's paid social. And they run hype. They just run creative on it. That's fine, but I think it's time for brands to really get into storytelling on organic socials. Mm-hmm. Document the journey. We see this over and over again. Brands who tell stories about their actual business journey. But the the point is really just using organic social as a different strategy to paid social. It doesn't make any sense to me if you've got paid social and then okay, sit down and look at organic social. Everything's the same as paid social. So I think organic social is also a way to, um, dr- you want to drive as much engagement as possible now so that those people also fall into your um, your middle funnel when it comes time to to advertising. So I think brands can really get clever with their organic social and fill those buckets, um, fill those funnels, um, not just using paid, but using clever organic strategies that, you know, don't look, organic can't look the same as paid. It, it just can't. Great advice as always, Paul. Um, and that is all we have time for. But before we go today, um, we're looking forward to having you in Adelaide, hosting you for the Adelaide Shopify Meetup. Um, yes. So anyone from Adelaide who's listening to this, Paul will be with us on the 26th of October at the Adelaide Shopify Meetup uh, to give a keynote about the future of Shopify. So looking at the Shopify roadmap, which is going to be super exciting. Yeah, if anyone's, um, any retailers are in Adelaide, we might have a few spots left. Uh, follow Ecom Nation or head to ecomnation.com.au. Follow us on socials and just drop, a, drop us a line if you're interested in coming. We'll see if there's any uh, spots available. Fantastic. And as always, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you do get some value from this podcast, um, you know, feel free. We'd love it if you could um, leave a comment, give us a rating um, and share it with your friends. Uh, we love helping out this industry um, and you know, look forward to doing it more and more. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mal. Thanks, Paul.